All rise. The Court of Appeals, Division One, is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, good morning. We're here for oral argument in Stewart v. Stewart. Um, as you know, we record and live stream these proceedings, so please give your name uh, before you begin your argument. We're going to give you 20 minutes per side, and you're not required to use all of those minutes. We're back for the first time of all being on the dais together and having a single podium, so you'll come up to the podium to do your argument, please. Uh, keep in mind that we have read the briefing, studied the record, and discussed your case in conference just prior to this oral argument. And with that said, uh, counseling may proceed. May it please the court, counsel. James Paddish on behalf of Mary Stewart. Mary Stewart was just 16 years old when she married then 22-year-old Billy Stewart in Las Vegas in December of 2013. She'd never lived outside of her parents' home before moving to her marital home. She had no financial expertise. She didn't even have a bank account. Billy, however, was the beneficiary of an UTMA account, Uniform Transferred Minors Act account, which was established by gift from his father. And that was held at the Fidelity brokerage account. One of the two errors made by the trial court, which is the subject of this appeal, regards the trial court's mistaken conclusion that the UTMA account did not belong to Billy, the beneficiary. In its findings of fact and conclusions of law, specifically paragraph 38, the trial court found, and I quote, the court heard no evidence to support a finding that the Fidelity account was transferred to husband. Husband testified that he has no access to this account and investments made from that account were done by his father. The court finds the husband's testimony credible. Uh, of course, this court must review the trial court's factual findings for clear error, but also reviews its legal conclusions de novo. In regard to ownership of the UTMA, the trial court's factual findings were clearly wrong. Your honors are all former trial court judges, and you surely know that it's difficult at times for even the most attentive judge to keep the salient facts straight during a lengthy trial, particularly one including accounting testimony. I have great respect for Judge Sinclair, both as a judge and a person. The error she made regarding the UTMA account's ownership is likely attributable in part to the fact that she was rotating from family court to criminal court and took this case but, with but her. But does it matter? I mean, what, even if she was right, does that hurt your position? It, it, it really doesn't matter who has control over the account, doesn't it? No. It, no, it, it matters who has the equity interest. Precisely, Judge. And the, the uh, record is clear here from all of the witnesses who testified that husband was the beneficial owner of the account. So whether or not uh, his father was authorized to transfer or not really is of no consequence to the ultimate ownership of the account. In fact, it seems to me that the court went on, um, and whether it made an erroneous finding or not, went on to actually analyze the uh, character of the account as if husband were the full owner, um, and then considered arguments and testimony that I assume you'll address shortly, but it, it seems like even the trial court blew by that finding. As well, it, it should have, Judge. Uh, in, in fact, husband in his pretrial statement conceded that the account was gifted to him by his father, and I think that that, that position is, is, is frankly inarguable, despite the fact that they've made now an opportunistic argument that somehow, some way, it didn't belong to him. Um, this UTMA account in Fidelity had two parts. It's analogous to a, a regular bank account with a checking component and a savings component. This one had a money market account and a stock account. During the marriage, deposits of inarguably community income was made into the money market account. And from that money market account over the course of the marriage, five different investments were made in mobile home parks. Uh, the evidence in this case included testimony from Mr. Hughes, who was the forensic accountant retained by husband. 
Mr. Hughes did not ever analyze the transactions within the money market account in rendering his opinion that in his view that these funds were traceable. Rather, what he did was he looked at the entirety of the account, that is the stock account and the money market account, and said that there was enough money in the overall account that was separate by which these transactions to purchase the mobile home parks could have been made without invading any of the community income that was deposited into the account. But the problem with that is it fails to satisfy Arizona law regarding explicit tracing. I asked Mr. Hughes on cross-examination specifically about this, and I asked him whether or not it was possible in looking at his opinion to determine how much of the community income was used to make these various purchases. And he conceded on cross-examination that he never looked at it. I asked him specifically, in regard to various accounts, one of them being the Sunshine account, the Sunshine RV purchase, I asked him, Mark... What page of the transcript are you on just for us? Oh, sure. It would be transcript page 53, lines 13 through 25, and it's filling over to page 54. I know Mr. Hughes, so I addressed him by Mark. I said, Mark, we're talking about the Sunshine RV purchase before the break. Do you recall that? He said, yes. I asked him, this investment could have been paid for with all of the previously separate funds residing in the Fidelity account before the $7,000, which was one of the several transactions of deposits that were made, before the $7,000 was deposited. He said, that's correct. I went on and I asked him, or it could have been paid with all of the $7,000, with the remaining $45,500, which is the purchase price of Sunshine, of the previously separate funds in the Fidelity, right? And he said, from an accounting standpoint, you could make that assumption. Then I asked him, well, it could have been made with a mix of some of the $7,000 and some of the previously separate funds in the Fidelity account. He conceded, from an accounting standpoint, that that was correct. I followed that line of questioning in regard to all of the transactions. Now, I recognize that there are some issues in family law that cause practitioners and judges some consternation. Tracing is one of them. It's just one that I think is analogous to what Justice Potter Stewart described in trying to identify what pornography was in 1964, that he knows it when he sees it. I think that was obscenity, but okay. I'll accept that. But tracing is like that as well. And the cases that have come down over the last 70 years never give an exact definition of what explicit tracing is. More often than not, it's what it is not. Now, one of the cases that was cited for persuasive content only, it's certainly not precedent, pursuant to Supreme Court Rule 111, was the recent decision in the Chauncey case. In that case, a different panel from this division held that when the separate funds were dwarfed by the community funds, in that instance, with the specific testimony that was described in there, that that satisfied the explicit tracing requirement. Well, that isn't the facts that we have here. See, if these separate funds resided in the money market account and were not utilized to purchase any of these properties, that's something Mr. Hughes needed to opine about in order for the court to reach the conclusion that no community funds were used. Well, once they're deposited into the same account, are you aware of any law governing the further tracing? Doesn't the account just take on a commingled character and, you know, you can certainly do pro rata calculations, but once they're commingled in the same account, I'm not aware of any law that would allow you to say this dollar was used for this purpose and that dollar was used for that purpose. If it were possible, I suppose that could occur from an accounting point of view, but it was not the testimony in this case. But are you aware of any Arizona law going your way or against you on the subject? Judge, I think the Porter case, and it wasn't with a specific dollar in, dollar out analysis, 
but they looked at the overall contributions that were made from the husband's earnings compared to the totality of the expenses that were paid. But in answer to your question, it wasn't a specific dollar for dollar. So that gets back to the pro rata theory. Right, right. And the pro rata analysis here doesn't hold water. That $7,000 deposit which was made in 2015, which was before the first investment was made, if in fact those funds were used in pursuit of the purchase of the Sunshine RV Resort, which was the first investment made, that would have accounted for 13% of the total purchase price. And you say that doesn't hold water? I thought that was your position. I misspoke. You said the pro rata analysis doesn't hold water. I thought that's what you were hanging your hat on. Yeah, the pro rata analysis doesn't hold water in this case because Mr. Hughes' analysis was that the overall account contained sufficient funds, and he never looked at the money market account specifically where the community funds were deposited. I apologize for the confusion, but are you saying that the expert's analysis doesn't hold water, or are you saying that pro rata is a concept that should not be used in this case? Both. The pro rata analysis is dead on arrival because it never looked at the money market account as a single account. Rather, his analysis was limited to only what the overall value was of the account, although the evidence showed that the stock account was never touched or affected in regard to any deposits being made or any purchases being made from it. But he didn't do a pro rata analysis. He simply said that because the community share was the minority of the account, it got no credit. Or am I misreading it? Yeah, I hammered Mr. Hughes on this point. He made up a term. He said that he performed and let me get it so I have it right. A pro rata explicit tracing methodology. That's what he said he used. There is no such thing. He conceded that explicit tracing is not an accounting term. Okay, let me approach this differently because I really need to understand your position here. Is it or is it not your position that the community is entitled to a lien equal to its proportional share of the account? No. Okay, what is your position? My position is that the community is entitled to 50% of the value of the investments that were made from the funds within the Fidelity account because they were hopelessly commingled. Okay, that's a very different position than I understood. So you're saying then that if the community invested $10 and there was $100,000 of separate property, the community would have a 50% share? Well, in all candor to the court, based upon the existing case law, I would be hard pressed to make that argument because the community contribution would be dwarfed by the separate property. Okay, so that's not the fact. So if the separate is $100,000 and the community share is $9,000, does the community have a roughly 9% interest or does it have a 50% interest? 50% because that's what the law in Arizona says. Did you make that argument in your briefing? Because I am in the same position that Judge Swan is, is that that is completely different from the analysis that I thought the argument that you were making to the court was that it was a pro rata. I think that was my assumption too, is that you were saying she put in money. They have an asset. It's traceable what they put in. We've got an asset over here that has a value. We can take a percentage of that based on the amount that she gave. I just don't remember seeing or coming away from the briefing with the sense that you were asking that she be given a 50% share of the trailer parks that were purchased from the money market account. I apologize then for doing an inartful job in communicating my position because the law that I cited in the brief was that when there is a presumption of commingling and when it's impossible to separate out the two, that the entire account is presumed to be commingled. Isn't it possible to trace back what was separate and what was community though? I suppose so, but that's not what happened here. Mr. Hughes did not do that and it was the burden of the husband to produce such evidence by clear and convincing evidence. And repeatedly when I asked him on cross-examination, he performed no tracing of the money market from which a pro rata analysis could be drawn. 
Right, but the record is clear about what the community, I mean, this is a case where, you know, you talk about the, how confusing uh, tracing law is in Arizona, but this is a pretty easy case. I mean, we have four or five or six community um, contributions to this account. We know where they were. The bank records are clear. Saying that that uh, that the expert didn't do this analysis, you're saying the expert was incorrect in his analysis. So if the analysis were made from scratch without him, what are we to do with it? What should the court have done? And so to say that because he didn't talk about the explicit tracing, that somehow now it's all commingled and we can't find where these community funds came in, that's not this record, is it? No, I, I believe it is, Your Honor. The law is that if commingled, there's a presumption of commingling, and that is the burden of the, the, the person who wishes to maintain the separate character of the property, present clear and convincing evidence that these funds were traceable. None was presented at the trial below. The, uh, uh, the, the well, what, what, what would the result have been if there had been no expert called? Um, what should it have been? All of the investments would have been divided, as was the Cotton Lane account, 50-50, and any remaining balance in the Fidelity Money Market account would have been split 50-50 as well. And that's the result that we heard. It strikes me that both sides may be overreaching a bit here. The expert um, wants to give the community absolutely nothing for a reason I cannot yet discern. And uh, you want the community to uh, receive a lien greater than the proportion of its contribution. Why are either of those sustainable positions? You don't have to argue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let, let me address the, the, the latter, <laughs> Judge. Uh, I'm not aware of any Arizona case law that provides that in a tracing case, the court will apportion by proportion the community interest and the separate interest in funds that have been commingled. And, and should you go down that path, I would suggest to you it's a slippery slope. At, at what point does it become entirely community? 10%, 9%, 15%? Uh, I suggest to you that it, it's like being pregnant. Either you are or you're not. And well, in this no, instance, uh, what about the Noble case? That, that seems to suggest that you, you can occupy a, a zone in between those two. As long as the funds are traceable, we don't just assume that everything is transmuted into community property. But I understand and I acknowledge that. Okay. It, it so, harkens back to So the, here we have easily detectable deposits. We have easily identifiable investments. I mean, why, why isn't that the simplest tracing task one could have? Um, we're limited by the record in this case, and the record in this case provides no authority for making that division. That is not well, what Mr. Hughes We don't Hughes get our said. authority from the record. We get it from the law. And, well, and the, the law seems to say as long as you can see what came in and what came out, you should, you should adhere to that rather than just treat it as all commingled or, or transmuting the entire character of the account into community. Uh, the law seems to suggest that that where you can see it, you ought to you ought to honor the the facts that you can see. And the record here does give us the amounts of the deposits and the amounts of the investments. Why isn't that enough, well, Judge? In this instance, there were five different purchases that were made. In order to reach the conclusion that the court alludes to, you would have to infer that the new money that was deposited into the account was used for the next investment that was purchased. And there's no evidence of that in the record. If the money accumulated, then at the end, there would have been approximately $30,000 of community funds that resided in the account. And the last investment that was made was approximately $50,000. So uh, based upon this record, I don't know how any reviewing court could discern what proportion of each of the specific five investments was funded with community I don't think you. I don't think you need to. Um, your your rebuttal time is rapidly shrinking, so I don't know if you want to save some. The the positions may gel a little bit after the next uh, argument. Thank you. I appreciate that, Judge. And I will reserve my time. Thank you. Sandra morning. Slayton for Appley. May it please the court. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning. Uh, absolutely, uh, 
the six transfers are easily traceable. They were attached as Exhibit 1 to Mr. Hughes' report in his schedule, and they are attached to husband's, uh, or I'm sorry, wife's opening brief. April 3rd, 2015, 7,000 was put in. 9 17, 2015, 5,100 was put in. Um, 5 15, 2016, 4,600 was put in. It's all there. 10-24, 2016, 7,162 was put in. 5 21, 17, 6,400 was put in. And finally, on 5 23, 2017, 900 was put in. It was a total amount of $31,162 between April 3rd, 2015 and May 23rd, 2017. Yet according to your expert, none of those contributions deserve any consideration at all in terms of, of the investment from the account in which they were put in. Well, Your Honor, the community, first of all, uh, there's a couple of things that um, I think are very important here. Number one, just like wife didn't you know, defended uh, counsel defended wife's position on this level by saying they were never arguing for a proportionate value. It was nowhere in their pretrial statement. They didn't ask the trial court to do that. They said they wanted only 50%. They wanted the lump sum. And um, in in cup in the marriage of cup. 152 Arizona 161, the 1986 case that was discussed so thoroughly in our briefs, the appellate court dealt with this very issue. And you said, William Cup did not raise on appeal the question of whether he is entitled to a community share of that portion of the award attributable to Vivian's lost wages during the marriage. He argued only that the trial court erred when it awarded Vivian the assets she acquired from the fund received in the lump sum payment. His only request for relief on appeal was that this court declare the entire lump sum payment to have been community property and reverse the trial court's judgment. That's just like what happened in this case. But that's, isn't that more appellate procedure than the substance of family law? I, I, I would acknowledge that it's to, to all of our surprise, it seems like the request from wife here is a little bit more far reaching than we expected. But, but he waived a proportionate interest. The next sentence reads, if I may, Your Honor, uh, we do not agree with the position. At the appellate level, there is an initial presumption that a judgment is correct, and pursuant to Chase v. State Farm, and then they cite it, the appellant must point out where the trial court erred. It is the function of this court to determine appeals based on issues presented to it for review, and we do not extend the scope of our review beyond the issues fairly presented. Since William presented us only with an all or nothing issue, that's exactly what they did here, that's exactly what they did at the trial court, I don't think there's an, any argument uh, I think they waived any argument that exactly. it, it's so, a waiver argument. So I was going to ask you, is your position based on waiver? Or yes. is your position based on some contention that your expert got it right? Because as far as I can tell, I very much doubt that your expert opinion even should have been admitted under Rule 702. It seems, it seems completely off base to me. Uh, why, Your Honor? If Why? I just, well, I mean, I'm just that, asking. No, no, no. That's that's very. I, I was actually going to tell you and, and ask you <laughs> questions about it. Um, no, it's it seems that uh, that what the expert did was uh, um, con conveniently, husband had the separate interest. The separate interest was more than fifty one percent of the total account, and so husband walks off with all the uh, the investment returns giving the community no credit. I'm unaware of any basis in law for such a theory. Your Honor, this, very respectfully, this case is very, almost exactly like the Chauncey case. And I know it's only persuasive. But it was the same kind of analysis. When you're, a trial, when you're at the trial level and your opponent doesn't want a proportionate interest, uh, doesn't bring it up, um, and ask for 50%, you answer that issue. That's what we did. And I'm not faulting you for that for a moment, but but you're no stranger to family law. Correct. Nor are we. Correct. And it is not unheard of that both sides might 
overreach a bit and the court has to find the right answer consistent with law however i would ask you to consider the following your honor the community was compensated there were only 31,000 and change in in the account okay so let let we can isolate it as you've done and i've done um when the court awarded there so, so the 31,000 dollars of deposits plus when the court was in the account when the court awarded the wife 50 percent of cotton lane which had a value and, a, and an actual purchase price i mean we gave the value which was the same thing as the purchase price a hundred thousand dollars the only reason Cotton Lane was found to be community, and it's in the record, was because the corporate documents had both names on it and the tax documents had both names on it. So the court said, I'm going to find that this is community. But the community really received a windfall. Wife received a windfall on that. The community received a windfall because the purchase price was 100000 That community interest was 31000 plus. That's, so that's covered, and, the, and I might add that this very same analysis was used in Chauncey. They said that there were, it was a little different in Chauncey, they said that there were um, expenses paid from the um, commingled account and that the community benefited from that, okay? Right. So it was the same thing. Well, here, I mean, it, you may be right. The community got something that could appear to some as a windfall because the corporate documents affected a transmutation of character of that Correct. one investment. But Correct. that doesn't really get to the tracing issue. The corporate documents kind of trump the tracing issue. I guess my my question is, let's say hypothetically, mm -hmm. um, the community had deposited 30000 and there was a separate component of 70000 just to make it easy. Mm -hmm. if, the, if that account buys a car, how much does the community own of that car? I became a lawyer because I don't do word problems well. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, I, am, I was a literature major. And okay, philosophy the train minor. leaves, no. Um, <laughs> but, so, uh, but I can answer your question. Okay. Because if it had been uh, if the issue had been, we always we always raised the fact that this was his separate property, whether it was by gift or by um, the father operating the account and then gifting it to him, it ended up, no matter what, to be his separate property. And so it was always our position at the trial court that um, the whole thing should be deemed separate and um, that's what the judge found factually. And you cannot, I mean, this was a, a question of findings and fact and conclusions of law. So only if the judge's facts are uh, um, clearly erroneous can you change that. But to answer your question, they never asked the judge to give such an analysis. That, I don't think that answers my question. They waived it. No, I, I don't think that answers my question. I'm asking you a hypothetical that doesn't involve waiver. I'm asking what the law would say about the percentage ownership under the, the uh, deposit arrangement that I outlined. You can trace that car. Uh, I, I mean, can you trace the car to the separate funds? That's, the, that's really the issue. Can you trace? The, it's all about tracing. Okay. So in my easy hypothetical, yes. I, I, I guess the, I'm, I'm, I was kind of seeing if you would go to the place where the community has a 30% interest and the separate property has a 70% interest and that's how we trace it. Do you think the law supports that analysis? I think that that's not how it was presented at the trial court. That's not what I'm asking. The law could have supported that analysis if that had been raised. Okay. It was waived. So, so is the answer to my question then yes, that that is a correct statement of law, but procedurally you have issues with getting to that result? Yes, procedurally okay. here, there was waiver. It was never presented to the trial court. And I literally, I mean, this case is identical to the analysis of COP. I mean, it just wasn't done here. And now they want to say, you know, even here they're saying, like, they weren't going to come up here because they thought that they were entitled to $15,000. They that This is not a $15,000 appeal. So that's why 
uh, of course, um, wife is saying she wants 50%. They did that all through the case. They never asked the court to analyze it like that. They never, not one ounce of the record, not even one ounce is dealt with on that. So you, are de you the court, are presented with, um, did Judge St. Clair, um, uh, were her findings clearly erroneous? And uh, her factual findings. I don't think Our, they were. We also have to consider whether her legal conclusions were erroneous on a de novo basis. I, I don't. I, I think they are uh, absolutely um, solid, Your Honor. Uh, there, there was a there was one fidelity account. Wife attempted to break this up into like did an artificial line here uh, you know there were two separate parts of the account and one was this and one was that we all have retirement accounts we all have uh, big accounts and they say okay here's you know part of your account is owned in bonds and part of it is in stocks and part of it is in cash it's one account there were never two accounts and so I think Judge Sinclair did absolutely the right thing it 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 tracks um, absolutely what happened in, we don't even need Chauncey, it, it tracks what happened in Cup. So if two sides ask a judge, each side asks a judge to do something illegal, is the judge supposed to pick between the two? I don't think that Judge Sinclair's conclusion was illegal at all. I think it was completely consistent with the law. Um, all we have to do is look at Chauncey's footnote five um, to conclude that um, they say right in footnote five, um, there are two direct tracing subtypes, subtypes, single instance direct tracing and serial and compound direct tracing. Gorman used both in tracing husband's assets. Single instance direct tracing is the simplest form of tracing and occurs when one asset is directly linked to another. Serial and compound direct tracing, which is really the pro rata, um, occurs when there are a series of transactions that are interrelated and increasingly complex. Well, these weren't increasingly complex, but when you analyze the whole account, it's the same analysis that was used in Chauncey that occurred here. And I might add, I'm trying to get my computer on. Oh, here we go. Um, I might add, oh, and as far as what you said in, as far as Rule 702, Your Honor, um, even there, when they argued the 702 motion, uh, to try to keep Mr. Hughes's testimony out, their expert, their own expert, had relied, had done pro rata analysis in the three other cases. I think that testimony was worthless, in, and I, and I, to be generous, and I think Judge Sinclair was absolutely in her in her power as gatekeeper to let Mr. Hughes in as a financial expert. I don't, I don't really see what expertise he brought. He brought tracing. Well, and he was, a, and she had. This is the kind of tracing, though, that can be done by anybody who's taken fourth grade arithmetic on a post-it note. I, I don't see why well, you need an expert to do this. Well, you might. It was in her discretion. You might not. Uh, you might not need like somebody with fourth grade arithmetic could do it. But Judge St. Clair decided in her discretion that she was going to let Mr. Hughes testify. I don't think that. That that means it was illegal. I think she had. Well, illegal is is probably an inartful word. Unlawful uh, might unlawful. be the better one. If I mean, if if the the analysis has to comport with law, and I don't see any law creating this bursting bubble that your expert used, well, saying the moment the moment the community interest falls uh, below fifty percent of the total amount, or the total account value, the community gets nothing. That doesn't seem to me supported no. by law. Well, that's what they asked for. They didn't go into the trial court and say, we want 15%, we want 13%. Uh, again, they we're, we're not here to evaluate the, the way that the, the, the case was pled as much as we are to look at the substantive law, I think. I think we have to look at the way the case well, was pled. That, that 
that may be true. I'm not, I'm not diminishing the importance of that, but I am trying to focus on the substantive law because that's where you can be most helpful to us today. I, I believe that uh, uh, in Chauncey, they actually said at paragraph 15, 16, um, and I think most of this is a quote, but maybe some of it's a, a, a paraphrase, sometimes the best records that exist will leave gaps in the chain. Through no fault of the proponent, each dot cannot be connected. If generally accepted counting procedures, GAAP can identify the separate portion of an asset to a reasonable degree that testimony should be sufficient to establish the separate nature of the property. But did your expert purport to use GAAP here? He Those did were completely use completely different facts. I mean, that they had no records for big periods of time, and that was a very complex, over thirty-year marriage. This, as Judge Swan said, is you've got five deposits from the community. You well, know six, exactly but... six. You've got you know exactly what went in. You know that he Correct. had it separately. They're not, other than the ownership issue, they're not disputing that it was separate property. Uh, they could have argued that they wanted fifty percent. And we rebutted that by saying they don't get 50%. And Judge St. Clair found that this was not substan sub uh, substantially commingled enough so that it, that it couldn't be traced and sh that it was... Uh, well, I, I and think the, that and was a conclusion, not a finding. And it's important because the standard of review changes... So I, I guess I do want to focus, uh, our oath is to the law, not to the lawyers, and I don't want to focus so much on what was argued right now as I do on what the law should, what, what redu result the law should produce. Um, and, and it sounds to me like what you're saying is had it been argued, that the community should have a proportional interest in the investment equal to the proportional share of its deposits, the law would have supported that, but it was not argued. Is it that was correct? not argued, and 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 cop is that a yes though? Because here's the problem: if yeah. we go back and say we're not going to go with your waiver argument, we want to know what your view is on what comes next. So is that a I, yes that it, if it had been argued? I, it, it could have been accepted if it had been argued, but we would have rebutted. Then you have to go on with that hypothetical, Your Honor, in arguing things that never happened. Because then we would have argued they don't get it because Cotton Lane gave them gave the community a windfall, and that was taken care of, just like in Chauncey. So we have to carry that hypothetical through to the well, end. Well, did the community get a windfall, or did it get what the law says it gets? I mean, the, the, it was it was. I think substantial evidence supports Judge Sinclair's finding because it, you you find that the community really did get its share in in getting back the Cotton Lane. There was it was a hundred thousand dollar investment, and they only had thirty one thousand. You didn't cross appeal that, so obviously you didn't think it was an no, issue. That I didn't cross appeal it. It was a non existent issue. He didn't bring it up. Right. Well, I'm but, saying but, you then, agree that, that the 50% of the $100,000 investment, this windfall, you're saying was error, but you didn't... Uh, no, I didn't say it was error. I'm saying we would have rebutted his... If, the, if he would have gone to the trial court and said, we want the proportionate interest of $15,000 or whatever, we would have rebutted that. It didn't happen. But if, they, if, if, if he would have... Our counter would have been, um, they're already getting that those funds. It would have been a different analysis completely, Your Honor. Okay. And that's really what I'm saying. So um, if, if we were to remand this, you'd be able to make that counter? If you remanded it, but I really, I, I believe that it's, it shouldn't be remanded. I think you should have the same result as in CUP. I think that he didn't make that argument. Do you, it's do you too late so now. It's an all or nothing argument, and it's gone. Isn't it a tad unseemly, though, for the court to endorse your expert's opinion? Your expert's opinion strikes me as, as being completely untethered to any notion of justice or law. It is it is simply favorable to your client using a method, this, this sort of majority interest uh, formula that I've never seen anywhere in the law. We can't really 
rubber stamp that without making that then a viable way to present cases in the future. And that concerns me. He just gave you the last best with zero seconds left, but I'll let you answer that question. I think the result was an equitable result. I think you have to rule that, um, well, you don't have to, you can do anything you want, but substantial evidence uh, exists to uphold Judge Sinclair's conclusion. So I, I don't think it should be remanded. I think Cup says it all. I think the correct analysis was used. It was echoing Chauncey. Um, he never made, I, I mean, it was a mythical argument that wasn't made. People waive things all the time. And I don't think it should be remanded because of that. I think Judge Sinclair had absolute justification for ruling that this was uh, um, um, not commingled to the point where it, it, it can't be deemed separate property. It was separate property. The community got their equitable result through the Cotton Lane. You can uphold it. And I don't think it should be remanded because of that. Thank you. Thank you. It sounds like you might want to address waiver. Your Honors, what, what Judge Sinclair found in, in, in paragraph 42 is, and I quote, the court does not find that the Fidelity account was entirely commingled. And frankly, I'm not sure what you are to make of that. Because well, I, I guess that dovetails with the hypothetical I gave Mrs. Slayton. It sounds like the trial court was thinking sort of the way I am, which is that it's partially commingled and, and easily divisible. But it sounds like your position is that that's not enough, which is which also troubles me. Well, in, in that position, Judge, that we've staked out is based upon the prevailing case law that when that there is a presumption in favor of the community and when there has been commingling, in the absence of explicit tracing, the entire account is presumed to be commingled. And less than until that threshold is crossed, a, a pro rata how, analysis. How much easier could a tracing case get than this? In all candor, I agree, but the burden was on the husband to present that, and he failed to do it utterly. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to say I, anything about waiver? Um, judges, uh, I believe that, uh, as you've already noted, that you have a, a, a duty to, to do justice, that this is a court of equity. The family court is a court of equity as well. I don't know that uh, this is a straight waiver argument that is being made. It certainly wasn't addressed by husband in any of his pleadings, both uh, at the appellate level or in the separate pretrial statement as well. This is a, a recently fashioned argument that's made. Thank you. All right, thank you. Counsel, thank you for your arguments. We'll take the matter under advisement and issue our decision in due course. We'll stand in recess to reset for the next argument. Thank you.